Uh, so hi and welcome to our Olympic preview series. I'm Sarah and I'm very honoured to be joined by two-time world champion and three-time Olympic medalist Megan Duchamel. Thank you so much for doing this. Hi Sarah, thanks for thinking of having me. I'm so happy to be here. Um, so it's really only a couple of weeks until the Olympics now. What kind of mindset were you in at this stage leading up to the Games? Oh my gosh, every day um, we used to say it was like rinse and repeat. We were just repetition, 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 doing as many run-throughs as we could. There was a point between December and leaving for the Olympics. So probably around this time where we worried that we hit our peak because we had done three weeks of clean run-throughs in training, never making a mistake. Um, and I remember our coach telling me that's what Olympic champions do. That's just what they do. They train like this so that they can compete under pressure and deliver. Um, so yeah, it was like so consistent from about the end of December until we finished our competition in, in Pyeongchang. And um, I remember being un, like not naturally relaxed. Usually I have a lot of anxiety and apprehension before a competition. I'm an extremely high strung person. Um, and all the energy leaning around Pyeongchang's Olympics and my preparation to go there once I got there, it was incredibly relaxing. Um, which I just kind of took as like a sign from the universe and I just went with it and tried to keep that energy with me. Uh, was uh, the preparation different going into your first games and going into your second? It was different um, mentally and physically because going into my first Olympics in 2014, we were only taking part in one program of the team event. We were doing the short program. We knew that beforehand. And then we would get a day off another pair team would do the free skate and then we would prepare for our own competition. There was a lot of unknown um, going into my first Olympics, like wh what's it like to live in the village? What's it like to do this and to do this? And just a lot of things that we didn't know. Um, and we had really high expectations on ourselves, probably a little bit too high. So yeah, it was, it was a really different experience, the Olympics in Russia compared to the Olympics in Korea. Going into Korea, I was much better prepared mentally. Um, because I had worked with a new mental trainer that season to help me get ready. And physically, we were ready to compete four times in one week, which we'd never done before, which is crazy. And um, like, it's crazy to think that the only time we ever did that was the Olympics. There was no like dress rehearsal. There was no simulation. We did run throughs every day, like as if we were simulating that. But um, we tried it out once and we were ready for it because we were successful in doing that. So we also had to, one thing we had to do leading into Pyeongchang and once we got there was really manage our energy because we knew that competing four times in one week was going to be more stressful. It was going to take more energy out of us, um, both emotionally and physically. So we really tried to manage that um, and stay really quiet and calm. So having that relaxing feel about Beijing, uh, Pyeongchang, sorry, <laughs> Beijing is not enough. <laughs> Having that relaxing feel about Pyeongchang um, really helped us to manage our energy, which really became a priority for us between nationals and the competition being finished at the Olympics. And how long after the Olympics did it sort of settle in that you've accomplished what you set out to do? Pretty quickly. Um, I remember going to the press conference after our free skate and they asked us if we were going to Worlds and we both at the same time were like, no, like we did everything we wanted to do um, with our Olympic experience in, in Pyeongchang and felt very satisfied. Um, I remember after the team event, we won that the team gold medal. And when I was standing on that podium with the team, I kept thinking to myself, it'll be so cool to be back here in two days um, for the Paris competition. And it really gave me a lot of motivation to get back um, on the podium and also to have great skates because we had really great skates in the team event. And of course, you're, you're always searching for that type of performance. So we had a lot of motivation like that. And um, it set in pretty quickly. And it didn't, I can't say it like changed my life. Um, being an, a Canadian athlete, um, I think that Tessa and Scott and Patrick Chan had a lot of the limelight. We didn't really get a lot of that, which was good because we weren't distracted. Um, and, you know, it didn't lead us to like a lot of crazy opportunities after the Olympics, the way that maybe it would have for American skaters or Russian skaters or skaters from these really big marketable like countries and getting a lot of endorsements and stuff. Yeah. Um, so moving on to the actual pairs preview. Um, but what have been some of your highlights of pairs in this quad? 
uh, any programs or any standout teams? Well, I think the rise of Machina and Galimanov has been really impressive. I mean, I was telling my husband when we were watching Europeans, they were ska- they've been skating clean longs for like three seasons now, mm-hmm. which is crazy. Um, I can't even remember other than her kind of stumbling out of one throw on the Grand Prix this year. I can't remember them making mistakes in a free skate. Um, and it's crazy how they their scores have just skyrocketed as they get more confident because I believe it was like NHK 2019. Um, I think that they skated a clean free skate and scored like 131 or 132. And now that exact same clean free skate is scoring 157. Like it's just, it's crazy, but that's their confidence has risen. Then they get better material, better programs. Um, GOEs go higher as you start adding little details. And it's been really fun to watch their really, I'd say their dominance the last couple of years, dominance as in consistent skating. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, I'd love to see that. And also to just see um, Shui and Han still push through and still try to, you know, keep their bodies intact and persevere for, for the Olympics at home for them. And just recently I saw a clip on social media that they've added back the quad twist, something that they used to do for many, many years, and they haven't done it the last few years. I'm not too sure how much more points it will get them. I'm not certain it's going to close the gap um, with Machina and Galimanov, but it's like, that's what they had to do. So they're doing what they need to, to push themselves towards the gold. And I really love that. Yeah. Um, apart from uh, Machina and Galimanov, which teams have surprised you the most? Maybe their transition from junior to senior or just a new team that's sort of stumbled, um, not stumbled, surprised us recently? Yeah, there's always those uh, shockers, right? I think this yeah. season, um, the Japanese team, Ryuji and Riku, really surprised everybody. Uh, I can't say they surprised me, though. They they train here with my husband. I coached them for, for a long time at the beginning. And when they first came, um, and Riku was just out of junior, she had been like 15th at Junior Worlds. Ryuji was always in the bottom of the pack. I competed with him for years. Um, and they came here, and I told my husband, they're going to win medals at big events in one year. And he was like, you think that fast? And I said, in one year at Grand Prix, Four Continents, they're going to be on the podium. And then um, at that one year mark, events were canceled because of COVID. Yeah. So their success was delayed a year, but I, I really did foresee it. I did think that they have the right attitude, the right work ethic, and the right charisma with each other to really be something special. Um, so I think that they really surprised the skating world. Um, there was their the response from the skating world surprises me because they're so loved by, by so many people. Um, but yeah, I think that they've been, you know, a, a great uh, surprise this season, a really like light and fun team to follow. They have a really unique energy um, when compared to the Russians and the Chinese teams. So hopefully they're going to continue skating together for the next couple of years. And we'll really see hopefully a Japanese team on the rise and, and winning medals at world championships and maybe at future Olympic games, who knows? Do you think they're good inspirations for Japan to take uh, pairs more seriously as well? <laughs> yeah, you'd, you'd think, we hope. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, Japan did have world medalists, um, Nurumi Takahashi and Mervyn Tran. They were really successful in junior as well. They won a world medal in 2012. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that didn't really set the pair skating world on fire in Japan the way that you would have thought. Um, but hopefully um, now with Ryuchi and Riku, that will start and more people will be interested. I know a big problem in um, in Japan, and I'm sure it's a problem other places too, it's finding ice time for pairs. Mm-hmm. In Japan, a lot of the times the skaters skate on public skating sessions um, and they are crowded. I've skated on some of them and tried to do pairs and it was impossible. So to learn pairs amongst those busy sessions is really difficult. Um, unless you're training at the National Training Center, you don't have the ice time for pairs so that's a big problem um, for them and I don't know how the federation would address that but hopefully there'll be a way kind of around it to start some younger pairs yeah very very hopeful for that because you know they have so much talent and such a deep singles field on both disciplines so it would be really awesome to see them develop more pairs yeah my husband goes every April or May and he does a pairs camp 
in Japan. And he okay. said, there's always a lot of girls and a lot of guys interested. And it's all girls with like a triple let's triple toe combination. And they're like, I want to do pairs um, because they just know the realities of the sport. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, he makes a lot of suggestions to coaches and skaters and very few things materialize from that. But from my understanding, it's because of ice time available to them. Yeah. And hopefully or after you said that, definitely, we hope that, you know, it will develop more and more. Uh, in the future especially yeah. after you know what might be an olympic uh team event medal for japan maybe i think yeah i'd say that they have a really great chance like not only to sneak in for a bronze but to maybe fight us or russia for a silver yeah. um it'll be it'll be really exciting and i think that um I think that ryuchi and riku feel a lot of pressure from that because they know that having a good pair team was vital to japan mm -hmm. having a chance at a medal um, but I think that they're, they have such a great mindset that they'll be able to really help Japan in that regard. Um, so speaking of the team event, you yourself competed in two. Uh, how far in advance did you find out you'd be competing? And then obviously when you did the one event, how did you know you were just doing the one? Did you get to pick which one you did or were you told? Um, in 2014, my my experience with both team events was very different. In 2014, we were um, the Canadian champions, but we were like direct rivals with Kirsten Moore Towers and Dylan Moscovich for years. Um, we usually came out on top, but they were right behind us. Sometimes they'd beat us in the long program. Um, so it was, there was no like clear cut who was the top one, I think back then. Um, so after nationals, um, we voiced to our coaches and our coaches voiced to Skate Canada that we would like to, if we were choosing, we would like the short program option. Um, we knew that that was our stronger program. If, if Kirsten and Dylan ever beat us, it was in the free skate. We knew that with our triplets in the short um, and our throw triplets, we had, you know, a little bit of a buffer on some teams. So we felt confident to do the short. We suggested to Skate Canada. That's what we would like to do. And they whether they used that suggestion or they decided before we told them, um, we were told uh, between nationals and the Olympics. So like in Canada, we only have about a two to three week window mm -hmm. in between nationals and leaving for the Olympics. And it was during then that we found out. Um, and even actually then we kept training and preparing mentally that we were doing the short, but I don't think anybody from Skate Canada actually like sat down and told us, hey, you're going to do the short. I think only once we got to Sochi, they were like, okay, yeah, you're in for the short. Like nobody had communicated it, at least to us, maybe to our coach they did though. Is it um, because the like team event was such a new thing, they didn't really know how to go about it or did they just I think a little do? bit of that, perhaps a bit of disorganization over who was doing what or communication, deciding which events you were splitting and which ones you weren't. I'm not too sure what it was, but it, it was like, we felt like confident that we were doing the short, but I, looking back, I don't know what made me so confident about that because nobody ever confirmed it with us. Um, but our coaches just kept on going along with us. Like, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll prepare for the short. So maybe our coaches did know something and they just didn't like tell us outright. Um, in 2017, 2018 into Pyeongchang, um, as we were preparing for that, Team Canada was pretty disappointed in Sochi not to win the team event um, in particular, Scott Moyer and Tessa and myself, like very highly competitive people. Yeah. Um, and I remember after when Scott and Tessa decided to come back for competition, going into Pyeongchang and Patrick had come back to competition. Um, Scott was very vocal about going for the team gold. Like this is what we were doing and we were banking on that. And Scott often asked us the summer before the Olympics, um, do you think you guys would do it all? And Eric and I were like, of course it, what we said to Scott at the time was it's our last Olympics. We'll skate as much as we can yeah. to get that experience. Because at the time that's, that's what we had thought. Um, and uh, Scott, Scott himself was very concerned about us competing four times in one week. He asked us many times, are you sure? Are you sure you can do it all? And we kept saying, yes, yes. Eric and I told skate Canada, we want to help Canada win that team gold. We understood that, um, we needed to do both the short and the long in order to like have the best odds uh, for that. Of course, there's never a guarantee, but the best odds. And um, yeah, we, we planned it throughout the summer and the season leading into the Olympics. So we knew well in advance that this was the plan. We knew well in advance that um, we probably weren't going to sub anybody in, in the end, 
we ended up subbing a lady um, because Gabby ended up winning nationals that year and not Caitlin. So we subbed a lady, but um, we had decided between Patrick, Tessa and Scott and I and Eric that we were going to do it all. Um, there was a lot of discussion about Caitlin and Andrew doing the dance event, which we felt pretty adamant about. The issue with that is you have to name your entries 24 hours in advance. So after the short, before the free skate, Skate Canada has to submit who's doing the free skate 24 hours before. And we, I believe it was after Gabby. So before Tessa and Scott even skated the free dance, we already knew Canada won. Tessa and Scott could have come last in the free dance and Canada still won. But when we had to submit the names the day before, we didn't know that. So that was like, we, I say it like it's me, but Skate Canada didn't know that. Um, so that was part of the reason why Tessa and Scott continued on to do the free dance because we didn't know it was a guarantee until it was too late to enter Caitlin and Andrew in. Okay. okay. Um, so looking on to... Oh, this Sorry, year's... that's my dog. <laughs> that's fine. Looking on to this year's team event, um, a couple of federations haven't named their teams, but we have like most Olympic teams at least. And then we sort of, we actually posted our predictions today on um who we think is going to podium and that's Russia um the US and Japan and we sort of have always have a don't leave out or like don't count out section and we put Italy and Georgia um because yep. I think the Georgian pairs have sort of come up almost out of nowhere maybe for the past two seasons and they've done some really great competitions um but what are your sort of overall thoughts about the team event this year? And who do you think's going to podium? Um, I definitely agree with you on the podium. I see very clearly, like no one else really seems in the conversation for the podium. It will be Russia, USA, and Japan. Um, I can see Japan and USA maybe switching spots, depending on who does what event. Yep. And also depending on how well everybody skates. Um, but yes, I definitely see those three and Russia as a very clear favorite. Um, for the podium, I don't see any other contenders bearing a disaster from Japan or USA. Mm -hmm. Would any other country have a chance um, for a medal? I think that when I look at it, I always think of like, who's going to qualify for the long, which is the top five um, countries, right? And right now I see the bubble for those, like you said, being Georgia, Italy, and Canada. Um, Canada, again, will depend on who they enter in each event, how other countries do. Um, will play effect into that and Canada just other than Piper and Paul doesn't have any front runners in any discipline so it'll just be really hard for Canada to get even close to um, to that podium but I think if Canada made the long program for the team that would be competing that would be a success for them um, because there's just a lot of a lot of new skaters on the scene um, and just really a developmental group but um, I definitely see Georgia like when I look at the numbers you never know how um, Mor Maurice, is that how you say his name? Morris yeah, Maurice. Um, is going gonna, is gonna to skate. Yeah. I mean, on any given day, he could be higher than Keegan if we're comparing to Canada or Keegan could be higher than him. Um, the, the lady that skates for Georgia has been much more consistent than, than Canada's entry at the Olympics. So I would go with Georgia in the ladies event. With the pairs, it's pretty close. Like given on the day, depending on how the Georgian pair skates or the Canadian pair that's chosen for that segment, mm -hmm. it could go either way. Um, and then the, the dance, the dancers, the Canadian dancers are a little bit ahead of that, but it yeah. just depends on how much space the Georgian girl gets between the Canadian girl and the Italian girl, how much the Georgian boy can get between the Canadian boy and the Italian boy. And then again, with, with the pairs, they're so close. It will be, um, you know, either fourth and fifth one way or fourth and fifth, the other way. Yeah. But, um, you know, I'd like to say China can play spoiler, but I just, I don't know if they're going to have enough. Um, even if they use Shui and Han in the short program and they win the short program, um, I just don't see Bo Yan. Um, and I'm sorry, I forget how to pronounce her name. I know her name, her English name is Beverly. But yeah, the girl I think that's Beverly. Competing. Um, their dance team is pretty good, yeah. but I just don't know if they're going to have enough substance in a short event to qualify for the free skate. Uh, but if they all, like if Shui and Han win and Bo Yan skates an amazing short, you can't count out China making the long either. And with literally every team event I did in Sochi and in Beijing, um, my goodness, I'm like, real, my brain is in Beijing. You're ahead um, already. Yang Chang, Italy was like a real spoiler in both of those. There was 
a day in Pyeongchang that I thought Italy was winning the bronze and not US. There was one day where it was really close and I was like, oh my goodness, this is actually going to happen for Italy. Um, so it's going to be really exciting to see who's going to make the long with Russia, USA, and Japan, who to me are clear locks and nobody's touching them for the podium. Yeah, I think Italy will be interesting because of their pair situation. Um, Della Monica and Grise had an injury, which is obviously why they withdrew from Europeans. Mm -hmm. um, the other Italian team, Gilardi and Ambrosini, uh, mentioned at Europeans that they were preparing for the team event, but obviously don't know if they were told short or long or what. Um, but they have and their very dance strong team ice dancers. Is yeah. a strong dance team, the man, men's yeah. event could be very strong finishes. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be um, really exciting. And there's going to be one really strong country that won't make the long, probably two strong countries that don't make the free skate. No. Um, and then once teams see where they're sitting after the short, they may adjust who they enter in a long program. Yeah, that's true. That that's true. could change things as well. Who do you think is going to be named to the Russian Olympic team? Um, I imagine that they're going to keep all of the assignments the same, except for the men's. I would definitely flip out um, Andre and Evgeny and, and swap them. Um, Andre's beat him now at two major high pressure events in a row. Yeah. And their, their season average is like within one or two points of each other. It's super close. So when things are that close and, and one skater under the pressure, under the gun, twice in a row came up on top, I'd say that's the skater to send to the Olympics. I'd love to say that um, they should send Tukmanisheva in the ladies event. And, and I do think that they should send her in the ladies event, but removing who to get her there, that's, that's kind yeah. of the thing, right? Who would you remove to, to get Tuck in? Um, and I just don't know the answer to that. I thought after the short at Europeans, um, Anna might be the one that was removed from the Olympic team for Tukmanisheva, but then she had a spectacular long. So I don't see that happening. So yeah. I think... Avoiding any disaster it took Manisha was just kind of out of yeah. luck this time. She had like the definition of a comeback free skate. It was, I don't think anyone was really expecting it. I think practice reports mm. weren't super great. And then she blew everyone away. Yeah, it was really impressive. I mean, it almost beat Camilla in that free skate with just one quad. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there, she definitely made a case for herself to be on the Olympic team. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, so moving on to the individual event as well, uh, who are your medal predictions for the individual event? Oh, my bronze medal prediction like changes all the time. Um, I definitely think the machine and Galimanov will have enough content in their free skate to very easily stay on top of Shui and Han, who I would predict to skate well enough for the silver medal. Um, but I, all season long, I was like, really Tarasova and Morozov for gold. And then um, after nationals, I was like, oh no, like they're not even gonna win a medal anymore. But then they were just so brilliant at Europeans. So now after their Europeans performance, I think that they could probably even beat Shui and Han at the Olympics. So I have like four medal contenders and the only one I see certain is Mishina and Galimanov winning the gold. Um, and I would say for the, the silver and bronze, it's going to come down to who skates well on the day between Shui and Han, Trasova and Morozov, and Boykova and Kozlovsky. So I, your fourth and fifth predictions would be Boykova and Kozlovsky and who else? Um, for, well, I would say like, well, like top Boykova five overall. Kozlovsky could end up on the podium should one of the other teams falter and they deliver. And they have been delivering quite well at the last couple of events. Um, so those are my top four for sure, the three Russians and the Chinese. Um, and like I said, second and third and fourth kind of like fluctuate in my mind, but I'm, I don't know. I feel confident as a skating fan in Machina and Galimanov. I hope they feel as confident as I do in their skating. Um, I know that, um, their coach Tamara Moskvina will prepare them very well. I do believe that they will be like third or fourth in the short though. I think when everybody does a clean short, um, should everybody do a clean short, they're just going to be a little bit behind, but they have enough content in their free skate. Um, I'd say for the fifth and sixth position, it's going to be between Peng and Jin and um, Riku and Ryuchi from Japan. That's kind of like who I would put in that fifth to sixth slot. Yeah. Um, and then you kind of have a chunk of skaters between seventh and 13th place that could all be anywhere on the day, depending yeah. on how they skate. Yeah. Which is um, crazy. It is. It is. It's going to be very like tense to watch for sure. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, so you recently commentated on Canadian nationals. What do you, oh, sorry, who do you think has the biggest medal potential for Canada in their respective disciplines? Um, I'd say that the only skater that's really in contention for a medal from Canada would be Piper and Paul in the ice dance event. If they had two amazing skates, they can put themselves in position to potentially be on the podium. Um, and that's really the only podium spot I see. I can see somebody like Keegan Messing finishing in the top five or the top six. Should he also deliver a great long program? We've seen him deliver great shorts. He can get himself into the final warm-up group after the short. Um, and I don't see any of the other Canadian skaters apart from Piper and Paul hitting a final warm-up group, but um, I don't see Keegan. He doesn't have enough content, enough quads for a medal, but he can definitely be top five or six, which would be spectacular. Um, and the, the pairs and the ladies are kind of going for, I would say a top eight spot at, at their best skate. Um, do you think Keegan uh, should or uh, risk the quad lots? I think he said he was planning on doing it for the Olympics. Yeah, I read something like that. I saw him land the quad lots once at the Grand Prix final in 2018, I think it was, in Vancouver. He opened up his program with the quad lots and then he didn't do anything else the rest of the program. So um, that was the last time I remember seeing him stand up on it in competition. So I don't know how much of a risk it is. Only he or his coach know his consistency in training. Mm -hmm. um, if he's not in a position to, you know, fight for a top five spot after the short, why not go for it? You have nothing to lose. If you're in a position to fight for one of those top spots, maybe it's not the thing to try. Yeah. Um, and then obviously at nationals, there was a huge controversy with the pair spot being given to Vanessa and Eric instead of Evelyn and Trent. Um, have you ever experienced a decision like that in your own career? And how much would it affect you as a skater? I can't say I've experienced something like that. Like I, I have experienced not making the Olympic team in 2010, but two teams went to the Olympics and I finished third. So I rightfully didn't earn my spot. Um, back then we didn't have such a big selection criteria published. Canada, I can't remember a time Skate Canada ever didn't follow nationals results. I don't remember any time. Um, in 1998, Emmanuel Sandu qualified a spot he didn't go to the Olympics, but it wasn't Skate Canada's decision. It was the Canadian Olympic Committee's rule that you had to have placed within a certain spot in like the world. And Emmanuel didn't fit that. Kind of like we see with, with Sweden and their rules oh, for yeah. the Olympics. So um, that was the only time they didn't follow nationals results. And it was really not um, Skate Canada's decision. So um, not following nationals results is not really it's like an unprecedented thing for skate canada action criteria was in no particular order um it also included results from worlds last year the results from canadians which in fact trent and evelyn had and eric and vanessa didn't have so some things went in favor of one some things went in the favor of another team and skate canada made their decision i think um the thing that upset a lot of skaters and coaches and people in the skating community um, a lot of them that I know personally and that have, have, I've talked to is the potential that this decision was made beforehand that's what I think triggered a lot of people it's not so much who they chose it was perhaps the way they did it yeah. um, if it was done beforehand because in the selection criteria it clearly states a date um, you have until January 9th to meet this criteria January 9th was the day after the free skate. So if a decision was made before that, that was Skate Canada going against their own selection criteria. So I think that's what triggered people more than just the choosing, like more than choosing who they chose. It was that maybe it was chosen beforehand, which skaters and coaches and people in the skating community um, don't agree with. Do you think... Um competing in the short for Vanessa and Eric was wise for lack of a better word was it planned maybe? the way they skated no it was definitely not wise at all um I think that the rumblings would have been a lot quieter if they just didn't show up at nationals at all um and said they weren't ready and they were still selected by the team for the team based on having the higher scores throughout the season that would have been a very different situation but to show up and be fourth in the short not only losing to Trent and Evelyn, but also to Deanna and Max. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think that helped the case. Um, and then um, there was a quote from Eric when they withdrew before the Olympic team was announced where he said, um, we withdrew because we wanna skate our best at the Olympics. So to already be thinking about skating at the Olympics when nationals wasn't even finished yet and the team wasn't named raises eyebrows. So I think it, it was those type of things that kind of bothered people. Um, I think had they not shown up at nationals and they didn't do the short program that they did, um, things wouldn't have gotten so heated. Would you have made the same decision on who to send? Um, you know, I don't know. Neither team is a medal contender. So you kind of take that out of the equation. Sometimes we see these type of decisions, like controversial decisions made because somebody does have potential for a medal. That's not the case with this. Um, so I don't know what I would have done had I been on that selection committee. Um, I probably would have gone with who's prepared right now in this moment. And I think, although Eric and Vanessa had the higher Canadian scores all season, we have to remember that they weren't placing that well in competitions. Kirsten and Mike this season beat them in three out of four short programs. And Trent competed against Eric twice, Trent and Evelyn, and they beat Eric in two out of two short programs. Mm -hmm. So by no means was Eric and Vanessa so dominant they were losing short programs to the other Canadians all season long. So yes, they had the higher scores in the free skate and overall, but there was not this clear dominance. Um, and, and that always like shakes things up. And then at nationals, Kirsten and Michael and Evelyn and Trent showed up clearly transformed teams than what we watched all season, right? We watched them struggle all season, skate very poorly all season. They showed up in the short and the free skate looking like new teams. Eric and Vanessa showed up in the short and delivered a similar short than they have all season. So for me, you're just looking at who's the most ready right now, three weeks out of the Olympics. Um, and I know that's the way Russia makes their selections. Who's ready now at the closest point to the Olympics? Russia doesn't care who won a medal at Finlandia Trophy or Skate Canada in October. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I would go with the decision of who was ready now in the moment at Canadians. But again, that, I mean, it would have been a tough call for anybody. Yep. And uh, what would you tell young skaters who are affected by federational decisions? How would you motivate them to keep them in the sport? Yeah, that's hard. That's hard. And I imagine Trent and Evelyn and their team around them feeling very frustrated right now. Um, not, again, not because they weren't selected for the Olympics, but because they may feel, and I, I cannot put words in their mouth, but they may feel like a decision was made before Canadians started. And that would be against the selection criteria. So I can see them feeling frustrated about that um, and about the transparency within Skate Canada's selection procedure. Um, and that's a really hard thing to get over when you kind of feel burned like that. Um, but they need to focus on themselves right now. And I, I told them, you need to focus on yourself this week, like leading into four continents because they're going to four continents and you need to go out there and deliver strong skates at, as strong as you did at Canadians on an international level. And you just need to find a way to show up next season and deliver strong from the beginning of the season. Because in a way, um, they didn't help their own case by being competing poorly early in the season. That didn't help. If they had skated better throughout the season, they probably would have been selected. So you have to look at it like from every angle um, and kind of like brush this aside and, and move forward. And that's a really hard thing to do. Yeah. And as well as commentating on senior nationals, we also did juniors. Um, mm. Who caught your eye that we should look out for either at Junior Wilds or next season? Yeah, um, Canada, unfortunately, doesn't have a lot of teams. We only had seven pairs in junior, seven in senior. We only have four novice teams. It's really um, sad to see the development of pair skating at, at this point. COVID hasn't helped because you can't do tryouts as easily as you used to. Um, rinks have restrictions. You can't enter rinks. You can't travel from province to province as freely. Um, so it's really limited new pairs from getting together. And that's that's been tough. Um, we did have, you know, a very clear top team in junior with, with Brooke McIntosh and Benjamin Mimar. Um, They won the junior national title. They actually competed last year as seniors in Canada, went back down to junior this season. Um, and I do think that they have a really bright future. Brooke's been, um, you know, winning a lot of events in Canada's 
um, novice, pre-novice, novice, junior um, pair skating with Benjamin and with her former partner as well. Um, and I think that they definitely have the elements to contend with some of the top international teams. And it'll be interesting to watch their progress with their choreography and their personalities and their um, emotions as they skate and, and see if they can take that up a notch as they go into senior next year. And uh, looking ahead slightly, do you think there's a deep enough field for Canada to aim for Olympic medals in 2026? Oh, that's hard to say right now. Because four years ago, would we have seen Canada go from gold to not even contending for a medal or maybe not even making a long? Um, I mean, that we wouldn't have predicted that four years ago. So it's so hard to know. I think Madeline, um, our, our national champion in ladies, is only going to continue to grow. I think that she has a lot of potential if she um, keeps on, on working in the direction that she is. I think that Kaya, who we saw in the Junior Grand Prix winning medals, she also has a lot of potential. We, we haven't seen her since the Junior Grand Prix, unfortunately, so it's hard to know where her skating is at right now. Um, dance, I think, will always be deep in Canada. We have such such great depth in ice dance. Um, and we have some, some good younger men coming through. Um, it's really the, the pairs that I think it needs a step up. We need, we need some great single skaters make the transition to pairs. That's the reality. Um, in order to be a successful pair skater right now, you need to be a great single skater. Like I watch Russian nationals and the pairs teams there are doing triple let's oiler, triple sow side by side. Um, and then in Canada, you have maybe a girl that's really great in singles with a triple sow and a triple toe and a triple loop, but they don't do the big triples. They don't do a triple, triple combination. You try to encourage them to go to pairs and they're insulted and think that they just want to make it in singles and they're too good for pairs. Um, and that that's an issue that we have here with with skaters. So I hope that um, in the next four years, we can get some good single skaters make that transition into pairs and they're going to see like the joy of, of that sport and learning, you know, a complete other discipline and new elements and maybe getting a lot of opportunities that they wouldn't have had in singles. Yeah. Um, and sort of you, you mentioned it earlier, but um, Sway and Han bringing back that quad twist uh, for the Olympics. Uh, can you talk more about your thoughts and do you think it's worth it? Well, I definitely think it's worth it because they need something like that. I don't think it's a high risk element to them. I mean, I've watched them do it for over a decade and I never seen them miss it ever. Not that I watch them train every day, but mm -hmm. when you spend a week at a competition with somebody and you watch their practices, you see a lot. Um, so I don't think it's that high risk of an element for them. I just, I think, unfortunately, um, the judging system right now doesn't reward quads and pair skating. And that quad twist that they will do is infinitely more difficult than the triple twist that Machina and Galimanov or Tarasova and Morozov will do, but it'll probably only score like one or two points more. Um, it's unfortunately not gonna be rewarded as much as it should be. And I still think that their inability to, to cleanly land a side-by-side -side triple sow will be their detriment in winning a gold medal, especially when you have a Russian team doing a triple sow, triple sow combination. Um, I don't think that the two points that they may gain on the quad twist will be enough at the end of the day. Um, although I'd love for it to be for them, they are amazing people and they were so devastated when they won the silver in Pyeongchang. Like I've never seen a silver medalist so sad. Um, it was really like, it was really sad to, to see that. So I know that this gold means a lot to them and to their country, but I just, I don't know if the quad twist is enough. They almost need the quad twist and a throw quad. And almost um, in a way, if I was like being strategic and I was like, Shui and Han's coach and I was being strategic, I'd probably just plan a side-by-side -side double sow. Because when you have them, if they try the triple and they have a major error, a fall, a step out, a hand down, um, a pop, this will affect their program components. I would probably plan a double sow and milk those components for all it's worth and get as much tens as I could. And maybe then they would, they would have a chance. So, I mean, I, I don't think that they would do that, but I'm just trying to like be like a strategist. And um, that's probably the route I would take if I was a strategist and I was on their team. Um, and with quad elements in general, people don't 
train them because they're not worth enough do you think or hope that as we head into like the next olympic quad that that will change and that we can help like keep pair specifically growing i believe that it will and i believe it will because i've heard russian coaches and russian skaters being adamant about pushing the technical side of pair skating um when the technical side of pair skating was being pushed by Shui and Han, um, by Eric and I, the, the Russians were really resistant to, the, resistant to that. Um, and um, a lot of decisions on the committees with the ISU, those decisions are based on um, votes and voices from the Russian skating community. So a lot of rules get changed when Russia is in favor of those rules being changed. Not always, not always, but I can speak specifically to the quad elements kind of being devalued. Um, it was because at that time, pairs in Russia weren't doing them. Um, now that I've heard pairs in Russia, coaches, skaters talk about wanting to do quads and throw quads and Tamara Masvina talking about wanting her teams to introduce the, these elements again, I think the values might go up a little bit, if I can say that. Um, I don't think it's right. I think they should have stayed up to begin with. Yeah. But um, like the the difference between a um, in singles, the difference between a triple sow and a quad sow is a, a big, big, big gap. But in pairs, the difference between a throw triple sow and a throw quad sow, the gap is so small. Um, and the gap with all of these elements in singles, in pairs, we don't follow that same gap with our throws. And as somebody who did a throw triple sow of pretty good quality, and a lot of people will say like, well, your, your throw quad was tight on the landing, so the quality wasn't as good. But the throw triple sow was quite smooth when we, when we did it in shows and in practice and, and whatnot. And to land a really nice throw triple sow and to even stand up on a throw quad, it is significantly more difficult than three points worth. <laughs> um, at the Olympics, actually, in our free skate, two of our lifts received more points than our throw quad. And uh, we didn't have that difficult of lifts. We, we kind of chose the easiest variations to get a level four, trying to like be as safe and accurate as we could. But to imagine two of our lifts getting more points than a throw quad, and there are two lifts that novice teams can do, junior teams can do. So it just, it doesn't make sense too much to me. And I would, I would like to see um, more quads in pair skating. And I'd like to see not just people doing a bunch of quads, but it's about skaters um, deciding what path they want to take for themselves. Um, and some teams, they like Shui and Han are taking that quad twist path because they see that this is the direction they need if they want to win the gold medal. Um, Trasov and Morozov have two amazing programs this year. This is the type of choreography and skating skills that they need to win the gold medal. Um, you know, like you have to find your own path and find out how you can, you reach the top yourself. And I think that we've been seeing throw triple sows and side-by-side -side double axles since the eighties. We haven't seen, you know, we imagine if we were still watching the men's do a double axle in their short program, yeah. because nobody progressed to doing triple axles and quads, we'd probably be a little bit bored if everybody did that. Um, so I think that we need more um, range between teams of who's doing what, who's pushing the sport in what way, everybody pushing the sport in a different way. Um, and that's exciting. So that's what I'd like to see if I was watching. And uh, a lot of the pair teams are they're starting to up their combination jumps, like mm -hmm. Michelle and Galliamo's triple sow or the triple sow. Uh, Pavlyuchenko and Kroydin did their triple toe, triple toe, double toe. Um, yeah. Even a junior team's doing a triple up or a triple sow. Like, do you think that's going to become more of a common thing in pairs? I definitely think that's going to be a common thing, especially as very good single skaters from Russia transition into pairs, and it's going to push the skater pair skaters in the U.S. and in Canada and China and Japan and whatnot. And um, the skating world is already like very aware of it. Like, my husband has told his Japanese team, "You're going to need more difficult jumps next year," and they've already started training triple triple combinations because they know that that's where the sport is going. And if you want to stay competitive, you have to keep on doing these things that the top teams are doing. So, um, I think that's great. I think it's super cool to watch um, fun and new combinations. Some um, Kane and Leduc doing the side by side triple loop. It just makes you stand out. 
And every team will find something different that allows them to stand out. Some of them will be their amazing choreography. Some of them, it'll be their jump combination. Some of them, it'll be their quad twist. Um, whatever it is should be rewarded. Awesome. And uh, to wrap up some questions from our Patreon Discord. Um, so from Laura, is there anyone you wish you could have seen at the Olympics this year? Oh, Laura, that's a good question. Who do I wish I could have seen at the Olympics? I mean, let's hope everybody that's planning to go is going yeah. because maybe I'll change my mind after Beijing happens and somebody didn't show up. Um, I would have liked to see um, Daria and Dennis, the pair team from Russia. I really, really like them. I know that um, it took them a bit this season to get their groove and they ended up skating well at nationals. It was just not enough in the tough Russian field. Yeah. So I guess... Yeah. Um, them. I could also say Han Yan in the men's event. Um, I really like his skating. He has the best triple axel I've ever seen in the world, in the history of men's skating. Um, and I think it's so unfortunate that he wasn't even given the full opportunity to qualify. Um, so I, yeah, I guess I would pick those skaters. Great. Like 100% agree as well. Um, so from Georgia, what's one piece of music you would outlaw from ever being used again? Oh, like a few, <laughs> um, Carmen, Swan Lake, any of these really, um, we say like overused pieces of music, Tosca, um, you can choose literally any music now. You have like endless possibilities. And for people to keep coming back to these like war horses, Bolaro, things that have been used by, by other people and done well already, I just feel like, you're, you're kind of wasting an opportunity to find some amazing music. But I know, I feel like that, but I know some skaters that just love to skate to this, these overused classical pieces. It's just what they love. So like, I totally understand people having their own opinion. It's just my opinion is to kind of get rid of that. I love how lyrics are used. Um, I love how that's opened up a whole new opportunity of music to be used. And um, yeah, I get rid of all the classical war horses. I don't think you're alone on that one, don't worry. <laughs> okay. um, and finally, from Lisa, what changes to the sport would you like to see in the future? Um, for pair skating itself, because that's a sport I know the most, I would really like some changes in the required elements in the free skate. I love how in dance they have a creative lift and a creative spin. Um, I wish that we could introduce a creative lift and a creative spin that didn't have to check the boxes to get a level four. You just had full freedom to do something super cool and unique. Um, and, and the same with the spin. When I, I did a lot of shows when I competed and when I retired. And um, one of the funnest things about doing shows was finding all these creative entries to elements, exits, um, different cool moves that were just worth no points in the system, in the current system. Um, so I'd really like to see some more creative elements being introduced in a free skate and you don't need to remove an element for a creative element to be added because a creative element a creative lift could last three seconds it doesn't have to last a long time um but yeah i would definitely like to see more creative moves um and and probably introducing quads to the women's short program i i think that they should have the opportunity to do that awesome uh that was a great night to end on so thank you very much for doing this thank you have fun watching the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> and do you?